In this lecture, we're going to talk about the overview of operational management in community pharmacy management. When we traditionally think about community pharmacy and management, operational management is probably what we think about most. We're going to talk about this this week, um, this video, plus an additional video about workflow will be the two required videos for you to watch. In addition, there will be an assignment for you reflecting on operational management and the requirements is to watch this video and also read chapter six on operations management in the book Pharmacy Management Essentials for All Practice. Also, I am going to have a short video reviewing what the final project will be for this semester and you can begin to start thinking about that also. So let us begin. One of the things we're going to focus on is comparing and contrasting about, you know, roles and responsibilities of chain drugstores versus independents, but a lot of the things that both have to do and the challenges they face are very similar today. Although many may believe that independent pharmacy is long gone and doesn't exist, it is still alive and well. In fact, the state of Pennsylvania ranks in the top five of the most independent pharmacies. But a lot of these pharmacies, in order to survive, to change, to adapt to the needs of their community, and to be able to provide goods and services to patients, providers, and payers, have to adapt, and operational management and workflow go hand in hand with that. The future is evolving for community pharmacy. As we know in all healthcare, there's a greater emphasis on the measuring of quality. Most physician practices in 2019, hospitals, ambulatory care services are shifting payment from no longer a fee for service where we pay just because you did something regardless of outcome to a more value-based payment. Community pharmacy has seen this payment system occur in a lot of our pay for performance contracts, um, focusing on Medicare star ratings. The definition of preferred and narrow networks is a very uh, slippery slope. A lot of times pharmacies, traditionally independent pharmacies, are not included as a preferred network. Most of the time this is not due to poor service, but just not able to get into those contracts. However, if you do get into those contracts, those contracts are heavily weighted on outcomes, on generic utilization rates, and adherence performance. And so the need for evolving community pharmacy to get more into the adherence business, the outcome business, versus the traditional distribution business can be very challenging but necessary and operational management is the cornerstone for its success. We're also seeing the consolidation of different pharmacies. We see pharmacies cutting back on staff. However, in order for us to be able to be paid differently, to be paid more on the health benefit side, this ha we need to change how we operate. But successful pharmacies of today combine providing excellent servants, convenience, access, and programs to improve health outcomes while lowering patients' overall health cost. These cannot exist or grow without a change in how we do our workflow, which is very heavily dependent upon operational management. Troy Trigestad, who is the executive director for CPSN, which is the Community Pharmacy Enhanced Service Network, which I'll briefly mention at the end of this lecture, has a great quote. He says, as long as you're providing value in the next 10 years in healthcare, you'll be fine. And so the focus of the business is to provide value and to focus on outcomes. That pharmacy, that business will be a player in the healthcare system. Where have we seen pharmacy adapt to evolve this? It's happened on the independent side, but it's also happened on the chain side. We've seen 
the, the growth of preventive health services, such as immunization programs, and pharmacies that have been able to grow beyond the traditional flu vaccine, focusing on other preventative vaccines in elderly patients, people um, traveling and traveling vaccines. Not only does this help the patient, but can also help the pharmacy in additional revenue and services. A lot of our pharmacy contracts, specifically our Medicare contracts, are heavily weighted with penalties if we do not meet adherence scores. And these penalties can, can reflect us in what's called DIR fees. And these penalties can be anywhere from 3 to 11% of the prescription we filled. So the necessary need to have types of adherence programs, and we'll talk about this in the workflow program lecture, about the need for some type of med synchronization program. Additionally, there are opportunities traditionally in Medicare realm of doing MTMs, and you can get a win-win for those. Not only do you get paid some revenue in it, but it also can enhance and grow your adherence business. But there are different ways people are growing to make um, pharmacy able to bill for benefits. And that is through participating in what's called pharmacy clinical networks. And pharmacy is still pushing from state to state to get uh, provider status, whether it's on the Medicaid level or Medicare level, and in some states, even the commercial level. If you can compare the structure of the chain pharmacy world to the independent pharmacy world, you know, most companies are set up like this. You have a board of directors, a chairman of the board of its corporation. You have a chief executive officer, and this chief executive officer is the person who sets the vision of the company, who is strategically planning. And we'll talk about strategically planning in upcoming lectures. You have the chief operating officer, whose primary role is to see over the operations of the company. And then you have the chief financial officer to make sure that we are not in the red and we're making profit. There's lots of different other titles that can that play a role in management. People can be in charge of just third party contracting for government affairs, fighting for legislation, pharmacy purchasing, you know, the, the growth of pharmacy services. And although in the chain world, the opportunity to have these as primary roles can occur, what usually occurs in an independent pharmacy world, especially the owner, the owner is wearing many hats. But regardless if you're a chain pharmacy or you're in an independent pharmacy, you yourself may be the pharmacy manager, but you may employ a pharmacy manager. And that pharmacy manager needs to be able to carry out operations. But as you know, we don't always have that pharmacy manager there 24-7. So the other pharmacists, who are usually the leaders of the business, you know, of the profession, have to step up and regardless if they like it or not, hold a role in, in management to make sure the day-to-day -day operations are occurring successfully. In chapter six, there is a case scenario. And the case scenario um, talks about, you know, why, you know, being, having skills as a pharmacy manager is necessary. So let me read the case scenario. Trey Smith is a pharmacy manager at Smith's Drug. It's a small independent pharmacy. His pharmacy performs regular dispensing, custom compounding, and sells a line of durable medical equipment. Trey has recently lost one of his senior technicians to a competitor and has since hired a new associate, Lisa. It's Trey's responsibility to ensure that every member of Smith's Drug staff is adequately trained in the pharmacy workflow. Lisa has no prior experience in pharmacy, but is willing to give a great effort and wants to be well trained that shows she can be an asset to the pharmacy team. Trey has outlined a plan with Lisa to get her up to speed on how to count and label prescriptions, how to compound medications, and perform third-party billing procedures. 
one of the most experienced technicians, one of the most experienced technicians at the Smith Drug, Bill, often often handles that position, you know, on busy days. And and is there at the biggest place of challenge, the drop off window. As part of the training for Lisa, Trey has decided to let her train at the drop-off position on Wednesday afternoons when the pharmacy business is slower so that she can work on inputting prescriptions and insurance information. This plan worked quite well for the past two weeks, but on this particular Wednesday, there happens to be a festival going on just up the street from the pharmacy. This has led to an influx of customers and prescriptions and are beginning to pile up at Lisa's stations. Customer wait time for prescriptions has increased from 10 to 25 minutes. What is the most appropriate action for Trey to ensure the success of his business? So if you think about the scenario, what are some things Trey has to do? Trey has to make sure that he doesn't, you know, m- you know, make, you know, Lisa feel like she's doing a poor job or she's failing, but at the same time, has to focus on the business and make sure we're not, you know, hurting the service to our patients. So Trey has to step very lightly on how can he bring Bill in to maybe help out with some of that operation, or maybe Trey himself may have to participate. This happens every day in a community pharmacy, that a lot of times what happens on a day-to-day basis um, is not, you know, in our hands, not in our control. One of the things we'll talk about in the workflow lecture is how getting into adherence and med sync may allow us to have better control of our workflow situation. But regardless, a good operations manager will be able to call, you know, call audibles, make changes in the action. If you look at the overall operational structure and process, there are elements of service delivery. One, the facility design. How is the pharmacy laid out? Is it laid out appropriately that makes efficient of location for staff, being able to access product, being able to interact with patients? Workflow considerations. What is the steps of getting from point A to point, you know, C to be able to make sure we're getting good outcomes? Personnel requirements. How well are we training staff, cross-training staff? How well are we addressing when staff are not meeting up to performance? How do we meet high demands? Scheduling plays a big role in this. And then the other thing is having a good structured policy and procedures of how we deliver our service. In addition, pharmacy is also having to deal with clinical, regulatory, and quality requirements. And these change from day to day. Just this fall, we are going to have to implement USP 800, which deals with hazardous drugs and how we handle them in the pharmacy, you know, and how our staff handles it. We're also going to have to, this fall, deal with interacting with physicians and making sure controlled substances hopefully become electronically prescribed. And we're always dealing with clinical and regulatory and quality requirements, whether it's requirements for the DEA, our wholesaler, and just our internal requirements if we want to become certified in doing additional services like diabetes education, smoke and sensation, or MTM-like services. The biggest thing is always focus on the primary role of a pharmacy business, and that is taking care of patients. So we remember, what do patients want? They want their problems solved, and they want to feel good. Peter Drucker, which it gets referenced many times in the Pharmacy Management Essentials book, focuses on this idea. The idea of businesses exist to serve society. A company should focus on serving its customers, and profits are simply a required resource for the company to continue to serve society. Now, I know for those going into wanting their own business, some of that self-satisfaction is being your own boss, being able to strategize, plan, but at the same time, you hope to get rewarded for your hard work, and so finances are necessary, financial profits are necessary for the business to stay afloat. 
The key thing in operational structure is making sure that we do the common things uncommonly well and that everybody is working as a team level and is finding satisfaction in their job. In the book, in the chapter six, they go through a scenario of most people who go into pharmacy, if you ask them why do they go into it, their number one answer is to take care of patients. Especially in a college interview, a new pharmacy um, student or future pharmacy student never is going to answer the question because I want to make good money to be able to provide for myself and my family. But think about this scenario. Would a pharmacist work for a pharmacy at minimum wage to take care of patients? If the wage, for example, was $10 an hour, a full-time pharmacist working you know, 2,080 hours per year would only earn a little bit over 20000 a year. But take into account how much loans that student has and has to pay back. If that would occur, that student would not even be barely able to survive just by paying back the loans. And so basically, we do need to have pharmacies to be successful if people want to continue to have the incomes that they do. And what have we seen currently in our current environment? With the, the pressure and squeezing of reimbursements, we've seen pharmacy salaries gone down. We even saw um, some of the major chains this summer lay off a percentage of their pharmacy workforce. There are economic and financial realities to any business in any profession. The, 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 the necessaries are we go into business to provide to patients, to serve society. And although we are a private mission, we need to provide income for the operators of our business. If you know that I've taught in the past, I teach this to all my students, is that for a community pharmacy to survive, the cost of dispensing, which basically is the cost to, you know, to be able to cover operation costs, which includes salaries, rent, overhead, has to be somewhere close to $11. And if it can't be at least 11 to $12, the pharmacy cannot survive. So even though most pharmacists go into pharmacy not wanting to be a manager, understanding the basics of a business is necessary that if we do not have enough sales or revenue whether it's by filling a prescription or providing an MTM type of service we need to have enough of those to be able to either cover our inventory so then we have enough gross profit that we can cover our operating expenses and stay in the black in terms of net income even a nonprofit regardless if they're not profit driven need to stay in the black just to stay afloat. So it's the role of the operations manager in any business to ensure that the smooth functioning of the business unit to achieve both public and private missions. And the manager in a public service institution faces the same task as a manager in a business to perform you know, profit, is they have to get good production from their workers to achieve the goals of the business to ensure that patients, customers want to use that business and continue to be able to get paid efficiently. So for a good operations manager, you must understand the vision, mission, and goals of an organization to direct your workforce. When we talk about strategic planning later on this semester, we'll, ref we'll reflect on how to write good vision, mission, and goals. The management structure of an organization also requires multiple roles be played. As I said earlier in that schematic of comparing uh, what are the roles in a chain drugstore, is that all businesses have a chief executive officer whose responsibility is to direct the strategic planning of the organization. We have a chief financial officer who directs the budget and financing activities of the organization. And the role of the chief operating officer is responsible to see the day-to-day -day operations carried out to meet the strategic planning missions from the CEO and to stay within budget so the business can stay afloat from the strategic you know, direct 
directives of the CFO. At the most basic level, an operation manager decides what must be done right now, who needs to be doing it, what resources do they need, and when is the work finished. This happens day to day in a, in a community pharmacy. And one of the things when I talk about in the workflow lecture, we have to, if we're going to want to do other services and expand, we have to have an efficient workflow so that we are still providing good service in prescriptions and also safety to prevent med errors, but allowing the pharmacist to be freed up to do other operations in the, in the business. If you look in chapter six, it talks about the decisions of an operation manager. You know, obviously it's decided by the company what should be offered for sale and what price. So sometimes that is usually coming from a more strategic plan manager. Sometimes the operation manager though is, is involved in what is the best workflow and methodology to provide good quality. What is the best location for certain services to be offered within the pharmacy? Layout planning of the pharmacy, the physical layout to give the maximum production. Human resources, which we'll talk about later this semester. How do you motivate and inspire people to do excellent work? Just giving money does not always motivate people. You need to have proper training. Scheduling. If you're not a good planner and scheduling of when overlap might be needed, additional technicians or support, then you know you can you can see the business fail making sure we have good supply you know dealing with our wholesalers inventory management which we will talk about it you know in more detail next semester is you know a vital necessity in today's pharmacy world to stay afloat because the cost of medications is so costly but the reimbursement is so small that tight inventory management is a must. The other thing is we have computers, we have robotics, so we have to keep those all up into working order. And on top of that, we have the clinical regulatory requirements that go along with all of this. There's many different theories, and chapter six goes through a lot of those different theories of operation management. The one theory is the theory of command and intent. And I like this theory, and I'll tell you why I like this theory, is that if you're going to be a successful owner, leader of a company, you can't afford to be a micromanager. You need to be, you know, you know detail-oriented to, and be abreast of what's going on. But you're only as good as the employees you cha- train. So you need to make sure your employees are working on the right tasks at the right time. How do you plan for this? How would you communicate this within a business? So you need to have strategies of being able to do this. You know, they, in the book, they refer to that in the U.S. Army has determined that the most successful battle commanders are the ones who are able to think critically and change tactics during a mission while still working towards the ultimate goal of capturing a strategic location. So good leaders are aware of the command intent of their orders. So a good operational manager needs to understand mission, the vision, and the goal of the company. And if you give them that and then give them the tools of how they need to make that, good managers will follow that. So a manager aware of what is desired outcome in relationship to the current mission and also knows what they need to do to focus on the end point to get there may change. So often think about different things that happen in the pharmacy. There are times where we may have things such as med errors, customer disgruntles, changes in the volume of the day, computer goes down, and if we're so rigid of what we tell somebody to do, we're not going to give them the skills to be more flexible. So we need to be able to, you know, you know, 
give some generality, all right, but we also need to give action lists. And those action lists need to be tied to consequences. And so for a good business to operate successfully, the if the employees understand the vision and values of the organization and what they're allowed to do within their job descriptions, then the theory of command and content can be successful. Because there's multiple goals for a pharmacy manager. We want to improve speed and efficiency to deliver patient service so that we can offer more services to patients, but we need to not make sure that our operations does not put us at risk for medication errors. We need to maintain uh, a collegial work environment for employees, and we need to make sure our employees are knowledgeable as a healthcare team of what we're trying to deliver. If you take a look at those goals that I just mentioned, you know, often, you know, workflow is a necessary. Are we using our pharmacist efficiently? Are they doing what they've been trained to do? If you get involved in management, you're going to have many business meetings. Do you set certain agendas for your business meetings? Do you set certain, you know, time frames for your meetings? Good, successful managers plan ahead, especially when it comes to meetings. And then the other thing in a meeting, realizing you're not going to get everything covered if you try, you know, of, if you had multiple tasks and maybe only one or two tasks are needed. I find that you need to do daily goals, daily tasks that have to be every day, every day need to be done for a pharmacy to be successful. However, each pharmacy may have two to three goals per week to accomplish, and you're better off just minimizing no more than three additional goals to be successful. The other thing is, what services do we offer to our patients? Can we provide it traditionally the way we do it? Do we need to have more training? Do we need to change workflow? How do we cre keep that collegial work environment? How do our employees enjoy working at the pharmacy? Are they challenged enough? Does the team work together? Do they know how to help each other out? The other one is improving knowledge. How often do you have meetings with your pharmacy staff? Or how often does the operations manager meet with the chief operating manager. How are you able to identify problems and resolve these problems to improve efficiency? How are those communicated to the people that are needed to help make that change? Can the pharmacist positively influence patient outcomes by educating others? Because we can't be successful just to rely everything on the pharmacist. It takes a team of technicians, clerks, so how can we obtain these goals? Cross-train staff members to understand the jobs. Better workflow, which I'll talk about in the next lecture. Maybe we need additional computers. Maybe we need to make sure we can have time for people to take 10 minutes to rest, get some lunch. Maybe we need to get people more trained to do a service. Maybe we need to develop you know, a corrective action plan so people are aware of consequences if they're late or not performing up the task. Maybe we need to have educational seminars before we implement a service, not just for our pharmacists, but for our entire staff. And then sometimes we may need to also educate the people we're working for. Patients by doing in-services to, to share with what our services are, and also to providers who we partner with. Back in you know, during the Industrial Revolution, there was what was called um, uh, a Sigma uh, management type of style. And this Sigma management type of style, basically, um, it was developed by the Motorola Corpor Corporation. And it, it focused on five principles, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And this Six Sigma approach was used to improve quality and output. However, when this was applied to healthcare, many systems found that this Sigma approach was good for, you know, maybe putting together a car or a cell phone, but was not good at delivering good service to patients. 
And so there was developed by the Gallup organization the human sigma. And the human sigma kind of follows those five principles of define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And they are, they are the following. Um, e uh, pluribus uma, all right, that, you know, that employee and customer experiences should be measured and managed under the same department. And the employee customer experience is directly linked and managed the, and, and, and to manage them separately would be inefficient. Fillings and facts. The Gallup research found that customers that contribute the most loyalty and therefore the most business to a company are the ones that have an emotional connection. We see this with social networking, social media, of how do we get customers engaged in our business. Think globally, measure, and act locally. It is the environment where there are multiple locations run by the same management. It would be easy to assume that all locations will achieve the same results. And unfortunately, and I can, I can uh, really relate to this in overseeing nine pharmacies, that every pharmacy has a different persona. However, we can meet the same goals if we address you know, some standards, but we also address what makes each business unique and the patients we serve in that area unique. There is one number you need to know. And the Gallup vast quantity of data surrounding the Human Sigma project suggests there is one performance metric that strongly predicts the success and future organic growth of a company. And it is known as the Human Sigma metric and involves the levels of customers' employee engagement. And evidence has shown that when combined together, high levels of customer and employee engagement achieve synergy. And so the sum of the two is greater than the parts. So the ability to connect with your customer, your patient, plays a long role. The last one is labeled, if you pray for potatoes, you better grab the right hoe. And this is the one that good managers should gather correct data in order to efficiently evaluate the company's performance and set goals. So when you are an operations manager, one of the things you're going to have to do is evaluate the success of how people are doing. But are you managing and measuring the right things of what they're doing? There's four dimensions of employee engagement. What do I get? What do I give? Do I belong? And how can we grow? So you as a manager, and we'll talk about this in our human resource lecture, is how do we get employees engaged, all right, of knowing what do they get for doing this? But being a part of the company, how do they give? Where do they belong? Job descriptions, roles and responsibilities, training, meetings, one-to-one -one meetings, team meetings. These are things that can help with success. And why is operations management so necessary in 2019, just as it has been in every year, is that pharmacy is changing. There's an initiative occurring right now. It's actually just starting this fall. It's called Flip the Pharmacy. CPSN, which stands for Community Pharmacy Enhanced Service Networks, is helping develop across the country. And here in Pennsylvania, we have what's called the Pennsylvania uh, Pharmacy Care Network. And these care networks are training pharmacists to do MTM-like services within a community pharmacy to deliver patient outcomes. The goal of this is to have a new type of workflow model in a pharmacy that addresses patients' outcomes related to medications so that we can partner with payers such as health systems, you know, medical benefits side, employers to improve the quality of patients but getting paid differently than the traditional product that we normally get from the pharmacy benefit manager. But to be able to do this requires good operationals planning and also requires good workflow. Your assignment over the next two weeks is to be able to take an idea of a service and think about the operational needs that's going to be needed for that service. So in summary, the daily work of an operations manager is get tasks done right, get tasks done in a timely fashion, consistent with the values of the organization in a way that creates long-term value. Thank you very much.